I don't know, you've probably come across this little diagram in the book, and it's quite a complicated diagram, so I'm going to just walk you through it a bit, and then I'll tell you the Egyptian story. So, this is, this is a sequence of interconnected causal loops. So the question might be, well, how does morality emerge from the bottom? And I would say, well, especially the morality that's associated with assuming that attention is something that's sacred, roughly speaking. Okay, so imagine you see someone really engaged in something. You might think, oh, I'd really like to be engaged like that, which is what you would think, right? Because everyone wants that. It's like, I'd like to be engaged. Okay, so then you might think, well, this person looks like they're um, fully alive, something like that. They're not being obsessed by catastrophes and all that. They're into what they're doing. What's that like? Okay, you'd say, well, that's associated with creative exploration. And then you might say, well... What, why is creative exploration useful? And the answer to that is because it can generate adaptive behavior of all sorts. Okay, so then what? Well, then you can imitate the adaptive behavior because we can use our bodies as representational devices. So we act out the person who's interested in something. So that's actually, in large part, why people like to buy art. You know, so lots of people I've seen buy art. They like to buy art because they also have some contact with the artist and they want to have some contact with the artist because it's kind of cool to have contact with an artist It brings something into their life and the artist is definitely someone who's outside standard hierarchies That's sort of what defines an artist So then, once you imitate the adaptive behavior, then you can play around with the imitations a bit And you can ritualize them And then you can dramatize them And, and drama is an interesting thing once it gets... Once it gets formalized you know, because basically what you're doing imagine little kids, they get together, they lay out some rules for pretend play then they run a pretend play simulation then imagine like little Shakespeare Jr. is off to the side and he's taken some notes and maybe he watches six or seven different pretend play episodes and he thinks well, this was the most interesting part of that and this was the most interesting part of that and this was the most interesting part of that I think I'll put those all together make them coherent we'll have a really good story and what the story is, is an articulated representation of a dramatic representation of a set of procedures It's two orders of abstraction, right? And you know this, because when you read a book I mean, this doesn't happen to me anymore, because I think I've read too many books But I can remember when I was a kid, when I was reading a book of fiction It was as if the, 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 what was being described was playing out in my imagination as embodied figures So, you know, sometimes you go to a movie of a book you've read and you think Oh, that person doesn't look anything like the person in the book, you know Because you have a representation of what the person is like I found as I've got older that, and I don't really understand this Is I don't have that anymore, but I still understand the books So, I must have become so automatized that that's all gone It's, it's, it's a loss, I would say But anyways, it doesn't matter you see that once you get the bloody drama written down, or even when you can say it, when you can tell a story, you're so close to having the, the pattern revealed in an articulated manner. You can't say what the pattern is, but you can describe it. Well, once you can describe it, well, you're right next to philosophy, right? As soon as we have a set of dramas that we can all agree on, especially once they get written down, then we can start thinking about the dramas. And that's when philosophy enters the stage, as far as I can tell It's like, the groundwork for philosophy is already laid by centuries and centuries of human interaction And we keep abstracting that up to the point where we can represent it And then we can pull out general principles And we discuss them and debate about them, but that's the birth of philosophy And all those levels interplay Like, it's not just, the causal direction isn't just from creative exploration forward It's each time you add a new level that interacts with the previous level, right? So you can talk about how you're going to play, or you can analyze literature, you know, or you can think about what you're going to write about. So, so each time you add another level of the capacity for abstraction, you make the whole system much more dynamic and complex. So the causal links, that's why there's all those little arrows on the outside. All of those areas are interacting with each other. So, yes. Yeah, too many arrows <laughs> Yeah, let me show you something here This is quite cool See that? Did I show you that before? Oh, this is so cool It's mind-boggling, this thing Okay, so the horizontal line You see all the little squiggles that are underneath that? Okay, every one of those lines is a biblical verse 
and the length of the line corresponds to how many references there is to that verse in other places in the book so you look at the bloody thing, man, that thing's hyperlinked like mad and that's partly why the book, the, you know, the, think about this book, like a normal book, really what you do you, know, you go see a movie and there's a timeline, there's a beginning and a middle and an end but it's illusory, right, because the person who was writing the movie saw the whole thing at once and so they could use their knowledge of the ending to, to fiddle around with the beginning and they could use their knowledge of the middle to fiddle around with the end that doesn't happen in real life so you can lay this out, now, imagine you've got a story and it's like 5,000 years old and 150,000 people have edited it and they all knew the end and the middle and the beginning and they just go like this well this means this and that refers to this and that refers to this and that refers to this and this means that and well you end up with that it's like it's infinitely dense you can't get to the bottom of it there's no way and really it's hyperlinked so, you, I could, you could say that, in a sense, the Bible is the world's first fully hyperlinked document Weird, so, yep Yes, and, and part, of that's, part of that's actually conscious Like, one of the things that people do when they're criticizing Christianity Is say, well, if you look at the Gospel stories, for example There'll be a little story about Christ, and then there'll be this line that says, Thus fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy. And the biblical scholars say, look, that was put in later, and the reason it was put in later was because the, the hypothesis of the Savior is nested in the Old Testament. And it keeps partially coming true with all these prophets. So a prophet is like a partial Savior. And in the Old Testament, prophets are just popping up like mad, and usually what happens is, Israel gets degenerate for one reason or another, it's because the king isn't being a good Marduk, basically and so then, a prophet who's very insightful, like Nietzsche or Dostoevsky, pops up and says hey, you're not paying attention to the orphans and the widows and you better get your act together, because otherwise God's going to come along and like flood you out or your enemies are going to stream in and of course, often, weirdly enough, the kings listen, because they think, God, this person is either completely insane or or God's talking to him, because otherwise he wouldn't be marching into the court when I could have his head cut off with one-tenth of a second's orders so often they kind of half pay attention but what happens, and this is Northrop Fry's interpretation fundamentally is that the whole Old Testament is the construction of an empire, Israel it's collapsed because of its failure to follow the fundamental moral order then it rises again, collapses, rises again, collapses the first story like that is the flood Right? And that's a really, really old story You know, the, the Bible doesn't get quasi-historic until Abraham The stories before that, so that would be Like the creation of the world, Adam and Eve um, The Tower of Babel, Cain and Abel No, no, that's later, Noah And then, it, then the Abrahamic stories start, and that's more like the history of Israel Even though it's also mythologized The, the first set of stories, man, those things are old who knows how old? Really old. 50,000 years old, maybe. They're old. So, anyways, what happens across time is that people have all these biblical books, and it's like what the Mesopotamians had to do in order to organize their society. It's like, oh, we've got all these writings, they're all sacred, hypothetically. They contradict each other, they don't seem to be in any order. Like, what are we going to do about that? And so then there's this collaboration of minds across centuries to think, Oh, well, it kind of looks like this might go there, and then this might go there, and this refers to that, and this refers to that and So it is, it's, it's trying to It's the collective imagination of humanity trying to make a coherent story out of experience That's what it is And, you know, it's, you might say, well, it's our best guess Is it true? Depends on what you mean by true Right? That's a very, very tricky question Partly, this, the question it's trying to answer is, how should you act? That's not the story, that's not a scientific story But it's a bloody important question Okay, good So, Egypt I felt like, do you know the story of, um, what was his name? Who discovered buoyancy? He ran through the streets Eureka, who was that? Archimedes? Okay, so Archimedes was trying to figure out how to measure the volume of something and he, I think he wanted to figure out how you determined whether an alloy was pure gold or not 
so you'd have to get the volume of the damn thing and then maybe you had a clump of metal that there's no way you could measure and then he figured out that if you had a tub full of water and you dropped the thing in it the amount of water that spilled over the edges would tell you exactly how big the thing was and then you could weigh your thing, your metal, and you could tell what proportion of it was gold and so he was so thrilled about that, he theoretically discovered that when he was in a bathtub he got in and the water spilled over he ran naked through the streets of whatever town he was in yelling, Eureka, Eureka, I've got it so, so that's an insight, right? so I felt like that when I, when I read this Egyptian story and I thought I figured it out so, because I thought, wow, that's mind-boggling so here's the story so we've got to show you some of these characters Okay, so, the guy in the middle, that's Osiris He's on this pillar, so he sort of represents what pillars represent, which is what hold things up Okay, and then the guy on the left That's Horus And Horus is, he's got the head of a falcon Okay, and the reason for that is that falcons fly around So they're not attached to the ground And they can really, 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 really see Like they're birds of prey, and they're about the only animal who can see better than us so, like raptors, birds of prey, they can see like mad Think an eagle, if an eagle was standing on the top of the Empire State Building, it could see a dime on the sidewalk So it's like, go eagle And then the one on the right is Isis, and Isis is, is queen of the underworld Okay, and then there's one other character here See, that's a Madonna and child, basically There, that character, that's Seth And Seth is, he's a bad guy Now, no one knows what the hell Seth is you know, nobody's been able to figure out what kind of weird animal that is So, um, who knows But, those are the four main characters Okay, so now you've got to know how they interact here So, you go to Osiris And the, the story, there's variants of this story, many But I'm telling you, like, one sort of canonical variant So, hmm? Story of Osiris and Isis and Horus Yeah so, um, and this is the, the story upon which Egyptian civilization was based Although it was a very old civilization, right? It lasted for thousands of years So, Cleopatra There's less time from Cleopatra to now than there is between Cleopatra and the pyramids So that kind of tells you how old Egypt was It's like old, major civilization Lasted a long time Had a powerful story, a powerfully organizing story, right? Way older than, like, than the history of Judeo-Christian civilization, say, 2,000 years Older than Chinese history It's old China goes back a long ways, though, so You know, maybe it's not older than China, but it's, it's up there Anyways, Osiris So Osiris was the god who established Egypt Okay, so he's like George Washington If, if you had George Washington 2,000 years from now then George Washington would be Osiris, because he'd be mythologized, right? So basically Osiris represents all the good things that the Egyptians did to establish order from chaos and set up the society So Osiris, he's a great, he was a great hero when he was young, and he did all sorts of heroic things and, and he established the state of Egypt, and he rules over it But, he's kind of old and he can't see as well as he used to, and he's little on the muddle-headed side, but worse than that So he's archaic and anachronistic And so what that indicates is that Well, just like the Americans are experiencing with their constitution It's like, hmm, things a little on the old side, what should we do with it? Well, we should update it It's like, well, we don't want to update it in a way that makes all chaos break forth, you know So anyways Things get archaic just because they exist, right? So if you set up a system of rules it's, to, it's supposed to adapt to this environment, but the environment keeps wiggling around right? So you have to chase it with the rules, and you have to update the rules as the landscape changes And that's, the biologists call that the Red Queen problem, roughly speaking Which is a reference to Ellis in Wonderland So Ellis goes down the rabbit hole, and she finds the Red Queen That's the Queen of Chaos, Mother Nature And, what, and she's always chopping people's heads off for arbitrary reasons It's like, yeah um, And one of the things she tells Ellis is here in my kingdom, you have to run as fast as you can just to stay in the same place And that's the chronic human problem, it's the problem of entropy, right? Is that you build something static, but things aren't static So even if it's a useful thing you've built, 
First of all, you've got to maintain the hell out of it because it's just going to fall apart But worse than that, the environment's running away from it And so your computers have OSIRIS problems all the time It's like they're just lovely for the first three years that you own them and then they're bricks And it's because the underlying landscape is so dynamic that the structure loses its validity You can almost watch it lose its validity Right, as a consequence of the exponential increase in computer intelligence So OSIRIS Great guy when he was young Little, old-fashioned, and worse He's willfully blind Now the Egyptians insisted on that, and that's so cool It's actually, you can be held responsible In an English common law court for willful blindness And what willful blindness is, the fail is the failure to realize something you could have realized So for example, if you're a CEO And you have a crooked chief financial officer and you think maybe he's crooked, but you decide, well, I'm not going to look at the books because then I'd know And then his malfeasance is brought to light and you say, well, I didn't know The prosecutor will say, yeah, but you could have And you knew you could have and you didn't And so you're, you're culpable for your own ignorance It's like, that's such a brilliant idea The Egyptians figured this out Osiris is not only old and, you know, decrepit and a little on the Alzheimer's side, but he won't pay attention to things. He's had it with that. He's willfully blind. And that's a problem. Because he has a brother, who's the evil brother of the rightful king, which is a theme that you're all familiar with if you've watched your Disney movies. He's like Scar in The Lion King, right? Same guy. Or in uh, Aladdin, there's a, some bad character. I don't remember his name. Lur hmm? That's the guy. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, he's the, he's the evil. Or, or Darth Vader in Star Wars. It's like... It's, he's an archetypal figure He's the evil brother of the rightful king Now why does the rightful king have an evil brother? That's easy, it's because Organizations tend towards decay and corruption across time That's what they do The socialists are really on this with regards to corporations, right? The evil corporations it's like, and, the, and the right wingers think, oh no, it's evil government So they're just projecting the archetype of the negative father onto the respect of organizations, when in fact it's actually a characteristic of organizations If you don't keep an eye on the damn things, they degenerate and they become corrupt So that's just what happens, you better stay awake to deal with that So anyways, Osiris has this evil brother named Seth And Seth, the name Seth, becomes Satan through the Coptic Christians Much, 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 much later So he's like the precursor to the, to the devil, roughly speaking Now. Osiris thinks Seth is all right, like, like Scar does, or like Mufasa does with Scar Underestimates his danger, something you should never do And so one day Osiris is just not paying much attention And Seth gets a big scimitar, something like that, chops him into pieces And then, because you can't really kill Osiris, because he's a god As well as being the founder of the state and the ruler the only thing you can do is make it difficult for him to get his act back together So what Seth does is he takes Osiris' pieces and he scatters them all over Egypt And the idea there is that When corruption overtakes an organization, then things fall apart But the things aren't actually dead You know, it's like when a corporation falls apart, all the people in it don't die They just fragment into Maybe smaller groups, some companies get spun off, or maybe they fragment all the way down to the individual level But there's still potency left in it And the structure is still there inside each of the individuals in the sub-organization So you can, you can get the damn thing to fall apart, but you can't get rid of it So fine, he does that, he scatters these pieces everywhere, so it makes it hard for Osiris to You know, recollect himself, or to get his act back together So things fall apart, and it's hard for you to get your act back together That's the idea and so, and then he rules the kingdom Which doesn't work out very well, just like Scar in The Lion King, right? Because he's an evil tyrant and All things considered, evil tyranny doesn't work that well Even for the evil tyrant Although you should never assume that an evil tyrant wants things to work out well, not even for him So, anyways, fine Osiris has a wife, Isis now Isis, she's a major league player in, in ancient mythology Isis is queen of the underworld And it's a real toss-up if you look at archaic cultures Whether the top god is the guy, the order guy, like Osiris Or the top god is Isis, who's queen of the underworld It's like, 
It's 50-50 for sure, and well, Isis represents chaos, and Osiris represents order, and they should be in balance Like, you know, if they're in harmonious balance, like Apsu and Tiamat, then they produce all sorts of productive things And if one overwhelms the other, well, then it's not so good, so they should be a harmonious couple Okay, but now Osiris is dead, whack, he's chopped up and spread everywhere, so up Isis comes out of the underworld Well, that's what happened when the Americans invaded Iraq it's like, well, Osiris is gone. Yeah, but what about Isis? Oh, we forgot about Isis. Up she comes. Chaos. It's like, there it is. So, and is it better? Not obviously. So, you never want to forget about Isis. So, anyways, Isis. She's not that happy that Osiris is gone because that's her husband, right? And she thinks, well, that's not so, so helpful. So, what she does is she runs around Egypt trying to find his phallus. And the reason for that is because it, it's the seminal apparatus, right? It's the seed of the new thing So what she does is, she finds this phallus and she makes herself pregnant with it And so, bang, she goes back down to the underworld But now she's impregnated, and so what does that mean? It means when remarkable things fall apart into chaos The seeds of something new are potentially planted Okay, so fine She gives birth to Horus Like Arthur He's outside his rightful kingdom, just like Simba, it's a standard routine, just like Harry Potter, right? He's outside his kingdom, and the reason for that is you're all outside your kingdom It's like the kingdom is sort of old and archaic and doesn't quite fit the circumstances now And it's not all that fair to you, and it's sort of arbitrary And so you grow up to some degree in the underworld in opposition to it So it's just an archetypal story So this, this character, she finally gives birth to this character, and that's Osiris And Osiris, he's, he's quite the... Character, he's, that's, oh, sorry, that's, oh sorry, his name is Horus, and that's Horus there And she's the benevolent goddess of all new things, as well as being the terrible goddess of the underworld And, you know, she's bringing up Horus, and Horus Where is he here? There he is, so Horus is this falcon Because he can fly around and see everything, and he's also the eye of the Egyptians, and so it's like He's like Marduk, he's eyes, he can see Okay, so then Horus grows up, and he's thinking huh, Enough underworld stuff, I'd like to have my kingdom back, my rightful kingdom Now he's different than Osiris, and the reason he's different is because he can see And not only can he see, he will see And that's a whole different thing, so Horus is not willfully blind And that's a drag, because he can see what's happened to the kingdom, and he can see Seth And that's not so good It's like you're in... In Romeo Dallaire's position then, aren't you? You have to shake hands with the devil And you know what happened to Romeo Dallaire when that happened? It's like post he's a general, right? I hope you all know this You know, he was there in Rwanda when everybody got massacred And the UN didn't step in properly, he had to watch all that It was like post-traumatic stress disorder instantly So it's like, if your eyes open and you can see evil, it's like You better look out because if you're face to face with real malevolence, the probability that that will damage your brain is very high You know, and one of the things that's very interesting, if you think about post-traumatic stress disorder, is that Often in soldiers, it's, it's, it's a consequence of something they did, not something they saw So they'll go out in the battlefield and they'll find out they're far more barbarous and cruel and destructive than they ever possibly imagined And then they, how are they going to fit that into like, corn-fed farm boy from Iowa scheme? You know, they can't do it. Poof! The whole structure's gone. It's very stressful to find that sort of thing out. And the people I've had in my practice who have had PTSD, it's almost always because they were subjected to some kind of malevolence. Like it was, they, they came face to face with something evil. And in one case, for example, I had a client whose boyfriend was going to rape her. She was naive beyond belief. And what, what gave her post-traumatic stress disorder wasn't what he did, because she could fight him off, she happened to be bigger than he was It was the look of malevolence on his face when he attacked her That was enough, and it, she had severe psychosomatic symptoms for four years after that She couldn't even sleep, her whole body would vibrate And it took a lot of untangling before we figured out that it was the look on his face And I've seen that happen other times, it's like be coming face to face with this sort of thing is no joke So, Horus can see, but luckily he's a long ways from it, yeah?
Yes, I can imagine. He ended up becoming an astrologer. Mm-hmm. I thought about later, I thought that actually, he, he sacralized synchronicity. Yep. He found some way of making... That's right. That's a net, hey? That's to put the chaos back in a net. One thing you might want to know about Hitler is that one day in World War I, he, he got a medal for bravery in World War I, by the way. So Hitler was all sitting around with his buddies in a trench, and he went off to relieve himself, and when he came back, they were all dead. Because a shell had landed right in the middle. And so that gave him the idea that he was saved for something special. And I can tell you, if that happened to you, you would feel, because what are your options? It's a horrible, chaotic, nasty place where brutal things happen at random. That's one option. Or you were saved because something special is waiting for you. It's like a toss-up which of those two you're going to pick, but you're going to pick one of them. So, anyways. Okay, so Horus, he can see Seth. Too bad for him. So he goes back to the kingdom. And he has like vicious fight with Set. And Set's like, they're pretty evenly matched. And so the idea there is that even if you're Horus, like son of, the, of order and, and son of chaos, and your eyes are open, it's like, it's a pretty evil, it's a pretty even battle. So they're fighting away, and Seth gets the upper hand and he tears out one of Horus' eyes. And then Horus, which is pretty damaging, you know, that's a drag to lose an eye. So his vision is damaged by his encounter with evil. But Horus keeps fighting, and eventually he prevails, and he gets the eye back, and he banishes Seth to the nether regions of the kingdom. It's like in The Lion King, where, you know, everything the light touches is the kingdom, and then there's the nether regions, that's where you send old Seth. So you can't get rid of him, can't kill him. He's permanent, because societies will always tend towards corruption. The best you can do is get the damn guy under control for a while. Okay, so now Horus has his eye, and you think... End of story. Pretty good story. You could animate that. He'd just slap the old eye back in his head, you know, pick up the scepter, and he'd rule happily ever after. That isn't what happens. What happens instead is he, take, he keeps his eye, and he goes back to the underworld. And he finds Osiris's ghost down there, and it's sort of sitting there like this, you know, it's, because it's all chopped up, and it, you know, it's a weird combination, because on, in one plain, it's, it's a chopped up body that's distributed everywhere, but down in the underworld it's like a ghost, a spirit. But it's not very animated, it's sort of in the land of the dead, like Pinocchio's father in the whale. So what does Horus do? Well, he, he gives Osiris his eye. So now, blind tradition can see. And then he takes his father, Osiris, back up to the surface, sort of, now they're a unit, arm in arm, so to speak. And it's the, com- it's the combination of Horus and Osiris that rule Egypt. And that's what the Egyptians figured out. It's like, God, that's so smart. It's like, well, you need the, st- you need the traditions of the state, right? Because you need them. They're, they're, they're vital. They hold back chaos. You can't just let that go, because then in comes Seth and up comes the underworld. It's like, that's not good. You need that as a bulwark. But then it's old and kind of blind, and it's going to tend towards corruption and fall over of its own accord. So how do you solve that? And the answer is, you pay attention, and you provide dead tradition with living sight. And if you do that, then you get to be the ruler of the state, the rightful ruler of the state. Now, the Egyptians basically hypothesized, this took a long time, that the pharaoh also had an immortal soul. He was the only person who did. But the immortal soul was basically the combination of Horus and Osiris. So the the Egyptians conceptualized that as something that was eternal. So, and it was the it was the eternal, it was the central eternal feature of sovereignty. It's so smart. And so as long as the Pharaoh was a good Horus and Osiris at the same time, then he was the rightful sovereign. And he was reflecting something of the utmost value. And it was immortal. It's so smart. So, what happens so interestingly, they call this the democratization of Osiris. So to begin with, in the Egyptian state, you could only use the Horus-Osiris symbolism if you were either the pharaoh to begin with, or at least a high-ranking aristocrat. But what happened as Egypt progressed, so to speak, as it developed across time, is that the right to use the symbolism that 
that was the Horus Osiris conjunction drifted down the dominance hierarchy. So at some point, all the aristocrats got to use it, never drifted down to like women or common people or slaves or anything like that. But, you know, hypothetically, the Jews came out of Egypt, and one of the things the Jews said that went beyond the Egyptians was that each person was, was capable was ennobled in some sense by their potential relationship with the highest value that was God and when the Christians showed up, that was universalized everyone had it, even prostitutes and slaves so it's so cool because what happens is these societies get the idea of, of sovereignty laid out in this phenomenal heavenly drama and they identify that with the thing that's at the top of the hierarchy, which is what they should do but then what happens across time is everybody wakes up and thinks, oh that's so interesting, it's characteristic of the Pharaoh it's characteristic of what should be sovereign, it's characteristic of what the highest value is but it's actually characteristic of everybody and it's, it's almost impossible to overstate how important that is, because our whole conception of the idea of natural rights is predicated on the idea that there's something about you as an individual, individual whose value is inviolable so much that it doesn't even matter what you do so if I see you brutally murder 20 people and there's 50 eyewitnesses and we know for sure you did it you still have to be treated as if your central essence is of tremendous value and you have to be given due process the whole law bows down before that and so then you think, well, do people believe this? this sort of Horus-Osiris combination and its relationship to what's ultimately valuable and the fact that that's embodied in every person it's like, they certainly act like they believe it and if, if they ever encounter a violation of that in practice, especially social practice everybody's jumping up and down and complaining it's like, you're trampling on my rights what do you mean? where'd those come from? what exactly, what are they? and are they real? or not and if they're not real well then I can trample over them all I want because they're not real but if they, and then we can just have an argument about what human beings are like but if they are real and they're reflective of an underlying principle that's continually attempting to manifest itself in a sense from the bottom up you better not break the rules because you're really going against the cosmic order so that's the Egyptian story It's like. It's mind-boggling, it's no wonder that story had enough dynamism to, to propel a whole culture across several thousand years it's like, it's a staggering achievement um, so would you say the violation of the unviolable um, rights that we put all individuals at? would you say that that is the Yeah, no, so that's a really good, that's a really good observation that's just one of the things that I, that I really that, that, that's something new that I've figured out about all of this in the last five years for a long time I still haven't got this right it's like, okay, what is your reaction when one of those principles is violated? so this is like the terror management question, right? well, for the terror management people, it's fear but there's a real problem with that because conservatives tend to be less neurotic than liberals and conservatives, who have a, more of a propensity for right-wing authoritarianism um, are more likely to get upset when rules are violated but the rules seem to be, so I think it's more, or I thought that it was more, no, no, it's not exactly if your rules get violated, it's not exactly fear, although fear is part of it it's the disintegration of your motivational states into general preparation for, for readiness so that's more like a generalized stress response and so everything goes on so that you're able to deal with what happens next it's like Gottman's married couples when they're the ones that are going to get divorced, right? they're very calm on the surface, but underneath it's like the underworld all hell is broke loose but then there's been a twist in that because there's a bunch of data coming together from all over the world that basically goes like this is that right-wing authoritarianism seems to be based on purity and purity is disgust control and there's a deep biological root, root for that like, people who are disgust sensitive and concerned with purity have better standards of hygiene and they do tend to live longer but they're also 
very much against, temperamentally against, any form of sexual contact that isn't bounded by the social contract and they don't like foreigners but that's all a clump, it's all the same thing and then we found recently, we haven't published this yet we found recently that we know conservatives are more conscientious than liberals and then we found that conscientiousness fragments into industriousness and orderliness which was great because people have been wondering for five decades how you plug the proclivity for right-wing authoritarianism into the general personality structure and it's complicated because if you're a radical liberal like a radical lefty th those aren't liberals, sorry radical lefty, a communist you can be just, it seems like you can be just as authoritarian as you would be if you were a fascist so, you know, that hasn't been quite sorted out yet but it's the orderliness that seems to make people have this right-wing proclivity and it does look like what they're trying to do is control disgust so yes, so what, what the violation of that order a huge chunk of it seems to be in this entirely new negative emotion system that we've only been untangling for 20 years and it's not associated with neuroticism liberals are actually more neurotic than conservatives you know, and you could say, well that's because the conservatives are so well protected it's like, no, no, you, you can't post hoc use your theory to predict the opposite of what you would have predicted before the data comes in it's like, no, conservatives are, they should be more physiologically reactive and there's some evidence that they are, but it does really seem to be disgust and so, to jump ahead a little bit, when, after we'd sorted this out now, a lot of the work that was done on disgust was done by Jonathan Haidt he's the guy that deserves the credit for the disgust purity linkage, it's a big deal and he was pushing the study of disgust long before people were paying any attention to it, so good for him when I was working on the orderliness disgust relationship, I was also reading this book by Hitler called Hitler's Table Talk, and what it was, was a, he would talk at his dinners, and they collected it from 1939 to 1942 and he would like just spout off on whatever it was that was on his mind, and he was a very open person, so it's very lateral discussion, he was very interested in art and culture but he was very, very orderly, and he was a worshipper of willpower and orderly people are like that, like um, anorexics are orderly, too orderly they can't even stand their own bodies, it's disgust that their bodies elicit and they prize the ability to control their bodies and that's hyperorderliness. that's I think why it's associated, it's generally considered an upper middle class disease and I think that's because a lot of people who are at that strata are hyper conscientious and that gets passed on to their kids and sometimes that's just too much anyways one of the things that really struck me about Hitler's writings, and it really, it really blew me away, I'll tell you, was that he has a metaphor. All of his thinking is metaphorical. And the metaphor is the Aryan race is a pure body, pure blood, pure, uncontaminated. And it's under assault by pathogens and parasites. Now, as soon as you know that, bang, you've got, his, you've got the underlying dynamic of of his appeal to the masses and Germans, hey, they're orderly so, you know, one of the things people say is that what happened in Germany constituted a decline of civilization, right? back to barbarism, it's like, ah, maybe not conscientiousness is associated with productivity, quite highly correlation is about 0.4, roughly the same as the correlation with IQ so conscientiousness is a prerequisite for civilization and you can think, well, why would you be disgust sensitive and orderly? and the answer might be, well, how much of your grain do you want rats and mice to eat? because they eat lots of it, right? and keeping the insects out of the food store, that's really, really hard so if you're going to store things up, which is what you're going to do if you're going to be civilized you better start to be concerned with hygiene you know, so those things are going to go together well, Hitler was hyper orderly and hyper disgust sensitive he'd wash his, he, he bathed four times a day and he was very, very happy about the ability to stand in the back of his car, his parade car, and keep his arm out like this for eight hours he thought of that as the triumph of the will you know, and the will seemed to be associated with this pro propensity towards orderliness so another thing that's really interesting, and, and I still don't exactly know what to make of this because it has complicated my conceptualizations because a lot of what I'm going to show you is based on fear and horror and horror is more like fear plus disgust it's some, you know, the difference between the Blair Witch Project and the Ch 
Texas Chainsaw Massacre. They're both horror movies, but one is pure fear and the other is almost pure disgust. So, disgust seems to be a huge element of this, and it is a primary response by orderly people to the violation of moral norms. Now, here's something weird. There was a paper published in PLOS One about a year ago, and what these people did was they they did, I think, a within and across country survey. And this wasn't in developed countries. So the question was, how much infectious disease was there in each of these geographical locales? And the next question was, how right-wing were the people who occupied those areas at the individual level? So they weren't interested in what the government was like. And what they found was that the correlation between the prevalence of infectious diseases and right-wing authoritarianism at the individual level was 0.6. It's like, and if you know anything about statistics, when you see 0.6, you just fall over and hyperventilate, because that never happens. It's an effect size that's it's bigger than 99% of the effect sizes that you'd ever encounter in the social sciences. It might be 99.9%. .9%. That's a negative? Higher the infectious disease rate, the more right-wing totalitarian the population. Why? Well, why do you think? They're regulating interpersonal contact and sexual behavior. Why? Well, think about it. You know, they're trying to minimize disease transmission vectors fundamentally. Now, they're not trying to do that. You know what I mean? It's an adaptation. Keep yourself out of contact. Keep yourself isolated. Well, I don't know. I don't know that, you know, because in lots of those places there have been infectious diseases for a very long period of time. So, but, anyway, so that's all very unsettling information, because it, it sheds a... So what it implies, and this is quite cool, it implies that the best way to control right-wing authoritarianism is to, is to instigate effective public health <laughs> policy. So if you all, if everyone has a sewer and a toilet, and there's no infectious disease, there aren't any right-wing authoritarians anymore, because they're not necessary. Now, that might be an overstatement, but, but it also might not be. You know, it's definitely one of the prerequisites for the kind of stability and productivity that's characterized the West, is that all of our cities has, have functional sewer systems and everybody has a toilet. It's like, it turns out that makes a big difference, especially when you don't have one. Well, it should. It should bring it out. You know, and I'm, I'm a reasonably orderly person. You know, if I go into a place that's chaotic, especially if it's chaotic and, and, and filthy, I have a really, really powerful impulse to tromp around until it's fixed. You know, because it just strikes me as things are deteriorating in a bad direction around here. You know, so... And I, I'm not... I wouldn't say that one of my most outstanding characteristics is orderliness, but it's... It's, it's up there. I'm a reasonably conscientious person. So yeah, it's a visceral response. And the visceral response is, something needs to be done about this. You know, and you can see how that's associated with conscientiousness. So what we've been trying to figure out what makes conscientious people motivated. Because conscientiousness predicts life success. It's like, well, are they interested in what they're doing? No. It's dutifulness. Okay, so why is that a motivator? We're thinking that what the conscientious person wants is not to slide into the disgusting bottom of things. So imagine the hierarchy, okay? Top is pure, bottom is contaminated. Why? Well, I can tell you one reason. If you take a given geographical locale, this is even true for songbirds, and you rank order the denizens of that locale by their dominance position, and then you let a pathogen in, the animals die from the bottom up. Right. So the bottom of the dominance hierarchy is where all the pathogens hang out. And so if that's disgusting and it's morally impure and you're bad if you're down there, which is really a conservative viewpoint in many ways, it's your fault you're there, right? And I'm not going to be there no matter what. And so I think what the conscientious person is doing is fleeing the bottom. They're not trying to get to the top. Except that that's the farthest away you can get from the bottom. And that's a purity motivation. 
Now, we don't know that yet because we haven't been able to figure out how to motivate industrious people in the lab. So, which is weird, right? Because conscientiousness predicts life success. You'd think that you could find a task in the lab that conscientious people would do better than non-conscientious people. We've tried dozens of things and not been able to do it. So now, we're, we're trying to make people embarrassed and ashamed and see if we can get them to like, donate more to a charity if we do that. Based on the idea that what's motivating the conscientious person is a flight from contamination. It could easily be. So, it's quite mind-boggling. Like, it was a twist. It was a twist I, I'd never, I never forecast in my conceptualization of these things. But the underworld, you know, it's a place of chaos and fear. But the underworld, that's hell. It's full of sulfurous odors, you know. It's, it's, it's not only terrifying. It's also disgusting. And it's associated symbolically with disgusting elements of the body as well so and purity obviously sexual purity for example is certainly a hygiene purity admixture and it's 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 flight from contamination and no wonder right i mean there are sexually transmitted diseases it's like a major vector of disease transmission we saw that with the aids outbreak you know without without uh, airplanes there wouldn't have been any AIDS outbreak, you know. Jet planes plus promiscuity? It's like, bang, you know. We almost generated a virus that took down the whole planet. So it's no joke when these things escape from their, from their little box, you know. You might say, well, why aren't people allowed to have the sexual life they want? Well, the, disease, the, ve the relationship between disease transmission and promiscuity is exponential. That's why. So, you know, you might think, well, that's no reason. It's like, okay, maybe not. But, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of people have died from AIDS, but it's lots. So, you know, yep. How do you distinguish between sex and ISIS? We'll do that later. We're going to be doing a lot of distinguishing of that. In fact, that's a primary problem of men. Distinguishing Isis, so that's the feminine underworld, from evil. Right. Right. Because, the, because, because there, there's a negative element to both of them, if you haven't differentiated properly, then the woman can carry that whole load. That happened to some degree with Eve, for example, in the, in the, in the Genesis story. It's so interesting, because if you read Genesis, we're going to talk about that later. The, the person who looks really bad in Genesis isn't Eve. The person who looks really bad is Adam. You know, so Eve offers him the apple, and like a dunce, he takes it. But then God comes along afterwards. He's all self-conscious now, and so is Eve. And so God comes along to have a little walk with Adam like he's used to doing. And Adam is hiding in the bushes because he's naked, and he doesn't want God to see. And so God calls him on it and says, like, hey, buddy, I can see through bushes. You know, come out here where I can talk to you. And Adam says, oh, I'm naked. I can't come out. And God says, how do you figure that out? And Adam, being the heroic creature that he was, said, you know that woman you made for me? It's her fault. It's like, well, who's the villain in that story? He's such a weasel that when he gets called on his disobedience, the first thing he does is blame the woman. It's like, yeah, yeah, well, that's an archetypal story. I'll tell you that. You know, so the temptations of Eve, you know, it's like the rapists who blame the attractiveness of the woman for the rape. It's like... The devil made me do it, you know. So, anyways, it's very difficult to distinguish one form of negative from another. And partly what we're going to do when we go through the symbolic differentiation process is put things in their proper place. So I would say, that's this. Oop, that's the wrong direction, sorry. I want to show you this one diagram and then we'll stop. There. So, for me, that's the map of the symbolic sphere. Okay, so what you have in the very background is the dragon of chaos. That's the absolute unknown, as such. So you can think about it as the chaos from which everything else emerges. So that's the unknown unknowns. Okay. On top of that, there's a feminine layer. And that's the Great Mother. 
and the great mother has a positive aspect, she's mother of all things, and she has a negative aspect, and she's, she's the angry Tiamat, the force of death that pulls all biological creatures back into her grasp, creation and destruction. So, on top of that, there's culture. And culture protects you from the great mother, just like with Osiris, you, Isis stays in the underworld where she belongs, but culture has a negative element and a positive element. So it's, it's patriarchal, it's represented by masculine figures, but it has an element that offers order, and an element that offers tyranny. And there's always a balance between those two. And so, if you're a conservative, you think, hooray, order, and if you're a lefty, you think, oh no, tyranny. And you're both right, right? Because every organization tends towards tyranny and supports you at the same time, so it's, it's right. On top of that, there's the archetypal individual. And that's also represented in masculine form for reasons that we'll get into later but it has a positive and a negative too and the positive is the creative explorer moving out into the darkness with eyes open and then there's the counterpart of that which is the thing you shake hands with when you're Romeo Dallaire and you shake hands with the devil and that's the individual too and one of the things I would, you can think about this, but one of the things that I really like about this map is that I think it's the antidote for ideology and the reason for that is that you can map ideologies onto this map but the ideologies only give you half the story so like the left wing story would be lovely virginal mother nature being tyrannized by the evil corporations as civilization advances led by the adversarial individual but the right wing story is the heroic individual bringing order into chaos to avoid the destructive element of, of the natural world. So that's like the frontier myth that, 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 uh, that settled the United States, right? Heroic pioneers moving civilization into the chaotic unknown. You can just slam those two together. And then you got the real problem, which is that nature slash the unknown is a creative source of everything and it will pull you into pieces if, if it has the opportunity. And then culture, it's like, you can talk and it's warm, you better be happy with culture but the probability that it's going to take you and crunch you and try to turn you into a cog is like, yeah, that's what it's going to do, that's what it does and then there's you, well, yeah, you're wonderful, interesting, you know, great creature but look the hell out, so, and that's right that, and I think the archetypal stories do a lovely job of, of continually bringing those elements together so, you, well, okay so that's good enough.